بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وقدوتنا محمد عليه أفضل الصلاة وأزكى التسليم اللهم علمنا بما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزيدنا علما يا رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته everybody welcome to our Thursday night women's class and this is the last class before Ramadan and we're going to take a break for Ramadan and then continue insha'Allah ta'ala after Ramadan. <coughs> so let's get right to it. Not studying Arabic, we're doing Riyadh Salahi. So Imam Anawi's next hadith, hadith number 29, uh, Usama ibn Zayd. Uh, عنه, narrated that the daughter of the Prophet وسلم, sent for him وسلم, as her child was dying. But the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, returned the messenger that was sent to him and sent her good wishes, saying to her, whatever Allah takes away or gives belongs to him. And everything with him has a limited fixed term in this world. And so she should be patient and anticipate Allah's reward. She again sent for him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, begging him for the sake of Allah to come. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam decided to go this time with Sa'ad ibn Ubadah and Mu'adh ibn Jabal and Ubay ibn Ka'ab. He took a whole group of people with him and Zayd ibn Thabit and some other men. They all went to see her. The child was lifted up to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while his breath was disturbed or troubled in his chest, meaning that his breathing was irregular, right? Clearly something was wrong with him. And I see that they didn't, yeah, shuddering is how they translate it in this one in front of you. Uh, in mine, they translate it a little bit differently. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw this, he began to cry and tears streamed down his face. One of the companions that was with him, Sa'ad, said to him, O Messenger of Allah, what's this? Basically, why are you crying? And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, It is compassion which Allah has placed in the hearts of his slaves. Allah is the compassionate, and is compassionate only to those among his slaves who are compassionate to others. In another version of this hadith, same hadith, different wording, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah shows compassion only to those among his slaves who are compassionate. So we have several things here. <clears throat> Keep in mind, this is the Prophet Sallallahu own daughter. And is reaching out to him, right, for help. And his first response is to not come. How do we explain the hesitancy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Why did he hesitate? Why didn't he come right away? Somebody, non-Muslim, could read this hadith and they could say, for example, like, what a mean thing to do. She's suffering, and he kind of just um, uh, thoughts and prayers, right? As people like to, to say today, when they're trying to express something that there isn't re really any action taken about it, right? We have, subhanAllah, in this country, shootings happen, mass shootings in schools, and then people, they say, oh, thoughts and prayers. And so this has become kind of a, a term for derision among people who would rather see some more concrete action taken. Is the Prophet ﷺ here just sending thoughts and prayers to his own daughter when his own grandson is about to pass away? What's going on? Why is the Prophet ﷺ hesitant to go.
Okay, mashallah. That's a very um, it's a very safe answer. That's true. Okay, every action the Prophet Sallallahu does becomes almost like obligatory for Muslims. So every action has to be done very carefully. That's true. So maybe if I can tease out something that's in your answer. <clears throat> um, it's almost like he's weighing his actions very carefully. And so he doesn't come at first. That could be it. But he has a message that comes along with his hesitancy. Or perhaps we should say his resolute decision. Maybe it's not hesitation at all. Maybe it's his very, very resolute conscious decision to not go. And he sends a message and he says, whatever Allah takes away or gives belongs to him. And everything with him has a limited ter fixed term in this life. And she should be patient and anticipate Allah's reward. So what's going on? Could you imagine responding like this to your child if you were in the, the, the shoes of the Prophet Sallallahu No, most of us couldn't. Most of us would buy the plane ticket, doesn't matter how many miles, would fly out. What do you need? Yeah. It goes against, it goes against how a lot of us would respond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how can we understand it? Okay, if, if we can't see ourselves in the story, if we can't look at this and say, yeah, yeah, that's what I would do, which I don't think any of us would, myself included. How can we understand the Prophet Sallallahu actions, his actions paired with his words? This is a nice dilemma. <clears throat> We have to believe that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was kind of good. I guess I don't understand his words, mashallah. Half of knowledge right there. What is, what's his daughter asking of him? At first, what, what's his daughter asking of him? For extending his life. Okay. The Prophet is not just any man, right? He's a prophet. And prophets, yes, work miracles. Huh. So we get we get the understanding that there might be a grasping here or a desperation. And we're not blaming that desperation. That's a very understandable desperation from his daughter. But we get the sense that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is responding to not necessarily the question or the form of a question itself, but perhaps the character of the question. Because the character of the question seems to be asking the Prophet Sallallahu not for support, but to fix it, right? To fix the situation. My son is dying. Fix this. Please, please. Do something. Exactly. And so if, if viewed in that light, what's the Prophet Wasallam with his actions and his words? What is he trying to teach here? <clears throat> Every parent should be able to relate to this, subhanAllah. Okay, it's the will of Allah. That's true. Everything's the will of Allah. What's more important or what takes priority? Changing the external circumstances or altering your internal orientation towards it?
if the Prophet sallallahu alaihi let, let's let's forget the the Prophet sallallahu alaihi for a second. As parents, okay, we see internal orientation exactly. We see our children go through difficulty. Have you ever met a parent that attempted to remove all adversity and hardship from their child's life? Every sort of adversity and thing that they came across, the parent wants to bend over backwards to change the result, to change the circumstances so that their child never experiences pain and loss and sadness and hardship. Have you ever met a parent like that? Yeah, I have. I've met lots of parents like that. Are we doing our children justice by that sort of love all the time? Now, let's, let's, let's be real. Like there's certain situations where it's like major life decisions, you know, things that are going to like really, really have huge consequences. Of course, that's part of being a responsible parent. But if we take this logic too far and we try to bend the world, we try to bend the world so that our children will never experience hardship and pain. What have we, have we taught them something or have we robbed them of a really important life skill? Yes, that's not. You're right. This is something that new parents especially experience. It's extremely hard. It might be the hardest part of being a parent to let your children make mistakes and to allow them to develop the internal resources and resilience the internal reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe the hardest thing. As parents, we want to remove all suffering from our children's lives. If we could take on all our children's suffering and bear it ourselves, we would do it every single time. We would not hesitate to make that deal. But that's not how life works. And that actually doesn't give our children what they need. It's actually not in their long-term interest because even if we were successful 100% of the time, who's statistically going to live longer, you or your child? Your child. So what are they going to do when mommy and daddy are gone? When the world bender is gone? They'll be left without the internal resources, without the correct orientation to deal with what is something that is a necessary part of life Allah promised us time and time again in the Quran and Surah Al-Ankabut and Surah Al-Baqarah, other places that he will test us with loss of life, with hunger, with sadness, with sickness, all these sorts of things. It's a promise. He asks a rhetorical question in Surah Al-Ankabut. Do you think that you'll be left alone to just say that we believe? Of course not. You're going to be tested. And so the Prophet وسلم, he senses in his daughter a grasping. He senses in his daughter a desperation, a, a call or an invitation to bend the world. To solve the results, to, to make the solution to change the circumstances. And the Prophet ﷺ needs her to understand that what's much more important than this situation or the circumstances is your internal submission towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to what he has decreed. Because let's just for the sake of argument, if the Prophet ﷺ comes and makes dua or whatever, if he would do so and it saved the child's life, it would already be something that Allah decreed. It's not outside of the will of Allah. And so he's trying to teach his daughter this very, very, very hard lesson for a parent, which is to that you shouldn't rely on me, you should rely on Allah in this particular instance. Or I detect in your calling me 
an over-reliance upon myself and our ability to manipulate the circumstances and an inadequate amount of reliance upon your creator who would never will anything for you but good, who would never give you anything except what you really need, even if it's bitter, even if it's hard. And just in case anyone would ever accuse, this hadith is amazing, because it doesn't end there, okay? She comes again, or she sends another messenger, she really, really begging him. And the parent part of him takes over. And he doesn't just come by himself, but he rounds up a group of people and they come. And his reaction is to cry when he sees his grandchild in this situation. So we know that it wasn't any sort of hard heartedness. It wasn't sort of any coldness from which the Prophet ﷺ was not coming in the first instance. This is not negligence. This is not um, a dereliction of duty. This was actually, despite probably his urges, like all of us, if we were in a situation to just run and try to bend the world. But he knew better and he tried to withhold the first time. The second time he said, no, okay, let's go. And he comes and he sees the child and he starts crying. And he has his companions so well trained at this point in patience and understanding the reality of Allah's will and our reaction or submission to it, that they're surprised that he cries. They have an incorrect assumption, even though they're very well trained and they understand, they have an incorrect assumption that to fully submit to the will of Allah is to not feel those things and to therefore not cry and etc. That crying is a is a symptom of not being fully submitted to the will of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ nips that in the bud real quick. And he says, no, 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 no. Tears. What's internal, what's feeling on the inside all flows from mercy. And mercy is not an obstacle to patience and submission to Allah's will. No, no, no. It's actually something that is a key aspect. It's something that's required of us. It's something that all of us should aspire to. It doesn't mean that we're going to run and try to change the world or bend the world. That's a different sort of thing. You can be both. You can be submissive to the will of Allah completely and understand the reality and know that this is the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yet have so much mercy in your heart that when you see such a thing, you are moved to tears. And so we see again that Islam is perfectly balanced between two extremes. Some sort of extreme mercy on one hand or something that people might mistakenly think is mercy where they think that mercy is really just alleviating all suffering huh, no way suffering is maqdur suffering is part of our existence and there's no end to it Allah has willed it and it will happen why does it happen? it's not without purpose it's not cruel it's not um vindictive or vengeful at least not always it's about training us to have this internal orientation towards the aspect of it that is willed by Allah and also allowing us the room to 
have an internal orientation towards empathy, sympathy, and mercy. And as Asma said in the beginning, the Prophet ﷺ, when he does something, it's an example for us all. And so as parents, we have to try to embody this as much as possible. To impart in our children the understanding of reality that suffering is part of it. And how we deal with it is more important than making it go away. But that we also are filled with love and mercy and tenderness towards our loved ones. Good stuff. Anyone have any questions before we move on to? <clears throat> our fifth portion. All right, so fair warning. So we will cover issues of fasting that are specific to women now, but because a lot of them hinge upon dealing with menstruation, okay? We're going to be talking a lot about menstruation. Um, there's going to be some very graphic descriptions about bodily fluids and things like this, because this is fiqh, this is all in the books, okay? So if you feel uncomfortable by that or whatever, you can leave or follow along on the Facebook um, live or watch it later on YouTube, it's up to you, but just fair warning, okay? Um, so talking about menstruation. <clears throat> Why is menstruation relevant to fasting because menstruation is one of the reasons that there is consensus about that not only are you allowed to not fast but you are forbidden from fasting during your menstruation forbidden and while we're at it there's four things that the scholars have agreement upon that you cannot do while you're fasting. Um, we have enough time. Go ahead. What what are they? I just gave you one. Number one is fasting. Okay. What are the other three things that there's agreement that you can't do while you're menstruating? Praying, a salah. Yes, that's number two or number one. Intimacy, yes. Specifically, and I'm sorry, but we have to be specific here, penetration, okay? And we're going to get into that. There's agreement that penetration is no-go for women who are menstruating. Touch the Quran. There's no agreement about that. There's a slight disagreement about that issue. There's one other thing. <clears throat> Yeah, that's the majority opinion, Dina. That's the majority opinion. But it's not a point of consensus. So cons we're just talking about points of consensus. So we have prayer, fasting, penetration, and tawaf, circumambulating the cap. Okay? So those are the four things that are agreed upon. When it comes to fasting, we need to talk about, okay, we know we can't fast while we're menstruating. How do we know when we're menstruating according to Islamic law and when we aren't, okay? Is the first little trickle of blood menstruation? Is the last little puttering out menstruation as well, right? And everything in between. What if it cuts off and then comes back? What if I'm regular? What if I'm not regular? All these sorts of issues we're going to talk about it. The first thing has to do with defining what is a menstrual period. Okay. What is the bounds of a menstrual period? At what point 
does the bleeding continue so far that we say, okay, this is not a period anymore, right? And similarly, at what point is it so little that we say that's not really a period? The majority of scholars say that the longest that a period can last is 15 days within the Sharia, okay? Meaning that within the Sharia, if it's over 15 days, then it is no longer called a period. Why does that matter? Because then the rules change. If it goes for longer than 15 days, then we call it something else, and then you have to get back to your prayer and you do other stuff, okay? But the actual, the actual period itself in Islamic law that prevents you from praying and fasting, etc., is limited maximum 15 days, according to the majority. Abu Hanifa said 10. So we see how this is an important difference of opinion that has consequences. If you've if you've been bleeding, you're bleeding for 11 days, 12 days. According to Abu Hanifa, after 10, you're not in your menstrual period anymore. This is something else. You get ready to pray again and fast again and etc. Whereas the majority say, no, you're still within this period of what is possibly called a menstrual period. What's the least amount? The least amount, according to Abu Hanifa, is three days. So if you have bleeding for two days, again, this is not called in Islamic law a period, a menstrual period, and therefore you are doing your normal acts of worship, maybe with some slight modifications that we'll talk about in a bit. And it doesn't reach the actual period of menstruation that prevents you from fasting until it's three days. Whereas Ashafi and Ahmed, they said that it's only one day and one night and Madik, he had the opinion that even a single drop. Okay, so we have, you see, on a spectrum, there's three different sort of opinions. Madik says any amount, and that's your period. No problem. As soon as it starts, that's, you know, prevents you from fasting and praying. Ahmed and Ashafi said one day and night. Abu Hanifa said three days and three nights. What about if we look at it the opposite direction? Okay, we have this period of purity in between menstrual cycles or your non-menstruating period. Okay. What if, what if you're menstruating a normal amount, six, seven days, and then you're done. And then three days later, it comes back. Is this considered a period or not? Is this something that prevents fasting and prayer or not? Is this something where there's a minimum amount of days in between periods? The majority say that the minimum amount, amount of days in between periods is 15, okay? Which is simple math, a corollary from their other opinion that the maximum amount of a period is 15. So according to this opinion, if there's only 10 days in between two different menstrual periods, Something funny is going on. This isn't a normal menstrual period. And we're going to talk about what we're going to call that in a second, inshallah. But first, before we do that, we have to ask about our young ladies, okay? What about our teenage girls when they start menstruating for the first time, okay? In Islamic law, we divide women into whether they're regular or irregular, okay? And having a regular period that you can pretty much anticipate um, is going to have a little bit different rulings than if you have a very irregular or erratic period. But what if you're a first timer and you don't know yet? Am I regular? Am I not? If I am regular, how many days is it going to be? I have no idea. In this scenario, the majority say that the young lady 
assumes that her period is going to last the maximum duration of a period. So 15 days according to the majority, 10 according to Abu Hanifa. And so they're just going to sit out fasting and praying for 15 days or 10 according to Abu Hanifa, no matter what's going on, no matter how much is coming out, even if it, whatever. And that you should pay attention to it and see when does it stop and keep track of it so that you can tell if such a person is considered regular or not going forward from there. If a woman is regular, let's say, you know, majority of women from what I'm told, um, menstruation is usually six or seven days long. Okay. What happens if you're regular? Normally six or seven days. Yes. Asma, even if there's a clear cut start and stop for new timers, because they're new timers, right? Just simply because they're new timers, because you don't know what if it cuts out for a day and then it comes back. And from what I understand, this happens sometimes, right? It's like you're at the end and you think you're at the end and it stops and you're like, okay, you know, I'm going to get a shower and then boom, then you have another kind of bleeding event. And you're like, oh, I guess I wasn't really done yet, right? So with somebody who's a first timer, they're not aware of that. And so they should be allowed the whole period to determine whether, uh, what is their normal, what is their normal duration of, of menstruation or not? So what if you're regular, normal menstrual cycle, six, seven days, but then you have this one weird cycle, let's say it's Ramadan, where you bleed more than you usually do. It goes on for longer. It goes on for this time, eight, nine, even 10 days. What should you do? Should you consider this as part of your menstrual cycle? Or should you consider this something else that's going on and make your ghusl, make take your shower and pray? The majority, the majority say that a woman, if she's regular, sticks to her regularly expected menstrual cycle, which might seem surprising to you, but that's the majority opinion. If you're normally six, seven days, and one time, freak thing, you go for nine, day seven, when you would normally be done, you're going to get a shower, and you're going to start praying and fasting again. And what's after is considered istihabla, which is kind of like, it's an anomaly. It's not actually considered part of a menstrual bleeding itself. It's considered a completely different type of blood that does not prevent prayer or fasting. <laughs> Good. Yes, this applies to all times. Exactly. So going over um, menstrual rulings, like this is for all times, but it has heightened stakes during Ramadan, right? Because when we're fasting and, and when we're considered obligated to fast is dependent upon, are we considered to be on our menstrual cycle or not according to the Sharia, right? So determining that is going to determine the other. Okay, here's a nice question. What if you have a break in the action? Okay, let's say your normal menstrual cycle is six, seven days. What if you go for two days in that time period where nothing, is, nothing comes, no bleeding? Is this considered one menstrual cycle? Or is this considered something else that's kind of two parts and in between is this period of purity where you have to shower and pray and if it's Ramadan fast? This is an issue that the schools of law split straight down the middle. Um, Abu Hanifa and the Shafi'i, rahimahumullah, they were of the opinion that this is all considered one period. 
that even if it stops two, three days, nope, it's all considered one period and you don't shower and you're not ob uh, obligated to fast or pray. Whereas Malik and Ahmed, they said that no, this break in the action um, indicates an end to the menstrual cycle. Yes, something strange is going on, but it indicates an end to the menstrual cycle. And so such a woman should shower, pray fast if need be, if it's Ramadan. And then if it comes back, it comes back. In which case she would resume kind of her um, break. Very, very quickly on postpartum bleeding, um, the scholars, all the schools of law agree that there is no minimum amount of time for postpartum bleeding. Okay. What they did, disagreed about is a maximum time limit. Is there such a thing just like your menstruation where there's a maximum time limit and anything above that is considered anomalous and not really the type of blood that prevents uh, fasting and praying? Because the postpartum bleeding takes the same ruling as menstrual blood, okay? Prevents fasting, prevents praying. Um, Abu Hanifa and Imam Ahmed, they said that the longest possible period of postpartum bleeding is 40 days. So anything after 40 days is not considered the type of blood that prevents one from praying and fasting, so you must make a shower and get back to it. Whereas Madik and the Shafi, they said, nope, 60 days, not 40. And so this has uh, stakes, right? You see that this actually has consequence. Is it possible for a pregnant woman to have a menstrual bleeding event? If you're pregnant and blood comes out, do we count this as a menstruation such that it would prohibit you from praying or fasting. Again, the schools of law are split down the middle. So you see with a lot of these issues, there is leniency. There is leniency. Malik and Ashafi, they said that yes, it's possible for a pregnant woman, for a pregnant woman to have a menstrual event. And therefore, if she bleeds, then she is prohibited from praying and fasting even if she's pregnant. Abu Hanifa and Ahmed, uh, together again in this chapter, they say, no, it's not possible for a pregnant woman to have a menstrual bleeding event. Yes, she can bleed, but this is something else. And so it does not remove the ob uh, obligation to, to pray or to fast. What about all the different colored things that, that come out, okay? Like uh, menstrual blood is a particular, usually, usually is distinguishable from other types of blood. Other types of blood, usually lighter in color, doesn't have the same smell. Whereas menstrual blood, and this, I was, you know, uh, commenting to someone the other day about how the best way to teach your child sex education is to study fiqh, because look at all the detail that you get into. So um, menstrual blood within the books of fiqh is usually talked about as being darker in color and with a stronger smell, okay? So what if we have other types of um, fluids or excretions that are coming out either during the menstrual cycle or towards the end of it or towards the beginning, right? There's yellows, there's browns, there's all these sorts of different things that are possible, okay? Um, the majority of scholars, they said that this type of thing is only considered, only considered menstrual excretions. If it happens for a woman who is regular during her regularly expected menstrual cycle, okay? So if this comes out of the blue, sometime where she's not expecting to be um, menstruating, then this is not considered a menstrual event that would prohibit you from praying or fasting. 
However, if it's in your normal period of time, you're usually six or seven days, you know it's, you know, you're a day or two away and it comes, even if it's an odd color, even if it's kind of different, then it's considered part of, part of your menstruation. What is the sign that someone is finished menstruation? The books of fiqh, they talk about two signs. Some women experience a white fluid. Correct. So the abnormal events are, they, they demark the end of a menstrual cycle, right? Or the fact that a menstrual cycle has not begun. And so therefore, they don't require ghusl. I mean, you require to remove the blood from yourself in order to pray, but that's something different. That's not about the ghusl that you're required to make um, due to having menstruated, right? <clears throat> so some women experience actually the secretion of a white fluid that signals the end of their period. Some women do not. Some women simply stop bleeding, okay? And so the majority of scholars, they say that whatever um, happens, whether it's sometimes this or sometimes that, or always one or always the other, this is what marks the end of your menstrual cycle, okay? So every woman has to pay attention to her own body and kind of know about herself. What's your, are you regular or not? What's your normal menstrual uh, duration? You know, uh, what's your normal sign of being finished your, uh, your menstrual cycle? Okay. What about women who are irregular? All of the stuff we're talking about, women who are regular. Women who are irregular are a little trickier, okay? And the scholars have several opinions as to what exactly should be done. Many of them, such as Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmed, they talk about whether there is the ability to distinguish between the types of blood, okay? So again, if you have that light colored blood that doesn't have a strong smell, then you don't consider this period blood. You consider this a different type of blood that does not prevent you from fasting or praying. Um, however, if it is particularly dark and it smells strong, then this is considered, you should go by this um, if you're not able to calibrate it by your normal timing, right? If you're an irregular person, um, it's all over the place. Sometimes it's five days, sometimes it's uh, eight days, and you know, it comes, sometimes you have 28 days in between periods, sometimes you have 20 days, sometimes, right? Like if you're very irregular, then you should try to stick to um, differentiating between the types of blood if you're able to. Um, Abu Hanifa, however, Abu Hanifa says, if you're irregular, don't go through all that headache. Just consider yourself um, in your menstrual cycle for the maximum time. As soon as bleeding starts, count 10. And that pretty much does it except for, okay, what can you do and not do if you're, um, okay, we talked about, I should say, we talked about penetration. Okay. You cannot, one of the four things that there's map, there's consensus that you cannot do if you are menstruating, according to the definitions of what we just talked about, is you cannot have penetration, okay, in that area. What else are you allowed to do? Okay, this is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars. The majority said that you are allowed um, foreplay for what is above the waist. Okay, that's the majority opinion. Imam Ahmed and others such as Sufyan al-Thawri and, and Dawood al-Lahiri, they said that absolutely everything else is permissible except for penetration. And I'll leave that up to your imagination to determine what that is. What if, okay, if, if you finish your menstrual cycle, before you can pray, 
you need to take a ghusl, okay? Ritual bath, all right? What happens? Everybody agrees that it's haram, it's not allowed for a man to penetrate his wife while she is menstruating. But what about this period in between the two? She's not menstruating anymore, but she hasn't taken her ritual bath. And what's the consequence of this particular issue? Because some women try to get back at their husband if they're mad at them. They're done their period, but they're going to delay their bath just to kind of get back. And I, this is tisk tisk. Don't do that. That's not good. But it happens. It happens. So what if it happens, right? They have a conjugal event before she's taken her ritual bath. Is this something that is haram or no? The majority say that's haram. Abu Hanifa says no problem. Do you have to do anything? Yes, they agree that it's sinful to have um, a conjugal event that involves penetration with someone who is actively on their during their menstrual period. But do you have to do anything? Do you have to like pay charity or some sort of penalty? The majority say, no, you don't. Uh, Imam Ahmed, he dissented. He says, yeah, you should give a few bucks to chatter, charity. Okay. And then, okay, last two rules that have to do with this are, I'm sorry, we've gone long. Um, shifting over from someone who's having normal, normally defined menstrual events and somebody who is having these abnormal bleeding events, right? Either somebody who is, good question, Isma. Okay, we'll, we'll talk, I'll give, I'll, I'll, let me circle back to that, okay? What about somebody who is having abnormal bleeding, either it's over the, the period that your particular school of law said um, is the maximum amount of time, or any of these sorts of other issues where it's considered, yeah, you're still bleeding, but that's not really menstrual bleeding anymore. Um, first issue is, what do you do about washing and praying and stuff like that? The majority say that you take one ghusl, okay? You take one ritual bath, and then you make wudu for every prayer. Wudu for every prayer. Um, Imam al-Shafi'i, he dissented, and he said that you have to take a ritual bath for every prayer, so that position of the majority is much easier to implement. Um, we know that you're not allowed penetration if you are a menstruating woman. What if you're in this other category where you are having abnormal bleeding events that are uh, not strictly defined as menstrual bleeding events within the Sharia? Is it permissible to um, have conjugal events with your spouse? Yes. Yes. The vast majority of companions and setup and scholars said that, uh, and all four schools of law said that that is perfectly fine. Um, the question of Asma, what about if you're unable to, you're unable to take ghusl due to traveling? Can you pray or fast? Okay, well, it depends on what we mean by um, aren't able to. Like if we're like really, really not able to, okay? Such as if we're in a plane, yeah, if we're on a plane, then I'm going to give you a tentative answer here because I recall the, the this issue, but I don't recall it with such precision that I can be completely confident. Um, what I recall is that you have something of a, of a grace period, okay? If you're in the middle of a day, for example, you're a dhuhr and you're traveling. You're joining and combining anyway, alhamdulillah, okay? So you're if in dhuhr and your period's over, then you wait. You wait until the end of asr, no problem. You're, you get your shower, you, uh, you pray, you resume praying and etc. And it's not a problem. Even if you weren't traveling, okay? There are scholars out there, and I can't recall at this point exactly whose opinion it was, that you treat it like traveling in the sense that Dhuhr and Asr go together, Maghrib and Isha go together. So that if you 
become, you finish your menstrual cycle during the hook and you don't have the means to take a shower, then you wait until, you can wait until the end of Asr, no problem. What happens if you, your menstrual cycle is over in Asr and it's about to be Mughlid? I need to hit the books for that one. I'm not, I'm not confident um, answering that off the top of my head. Very good question. But you don't need, um, uh, that's all about praying. You don't need um, to have ghusl to fast. We said in our other class, if you, for example, were um, having intimate moments with your spouse at Fedger or be right before Fedger, and then you only have enough time for either a quick sahur or a shower, you go with sahur. It's not a problem to be fasting and you're not in a state of ritual purity. Any other questions? We went way over time. So I won't repeat myself. I'll just tell you when it comes to the other issues such as um, pregnancy and breastfeeding, we talked about that in the Sunday class. So um, you can avail yourselves of the video. And you know, we went 15 minutes over, so I don't wanna delay you any longer. Any other questions? Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much for your participation. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Take care, everybody. And I'll see you next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Rahmatullahi.